The purpose of this webinar is to give a general, very general overview of the content and the resources for the Science Olympiad 2020 competition year. The um, competition is going to be held in 2020 on May 15th and 16th at the North Carolina State University in Raleigh, North Carolina. And this particular webinar is discussing the middle school B division event, which this year is Reach for the Stars. It has been solar system for the past two years. As you know, there's a two year rotation between solar system and Reach for the Stars. So you have to go back three years when Reach for the Stars was done the last time. So if you were in sixth grade, then you have done this before and you have a little bit of knowledge already about stellar evolution. If not, then you are starting from scratch if you've just finished solar system. So the, um, as you know, many of you know, my name is Donna Young. I am the National Event Supervisor for the Astronomy Event. I'm helping out this year though with doing the webinar for the B Division event. And this program that for Science Olympia, the Space Science Events, is supported by the NASA Universe of Learning STEM Literacy Outreach Program from the Astrophysics Division via the Chandra X-ray Observatory and with a partnership with National Science Olympiad to provide resources and materials specifically targeting Science Olympiad space science events, solar system, reach for the stars, and astronomy. So, um, this webinar is going to be posted on the Chandra website, and the webinar will be posted along with a transcript of the webinar. And at the same time, this PowerPoint will be posted on the National Science Olympiad website along with the transcript also. And just to let you know that on each one of these slides that you're going to see in the notes section, there is a link directly to additional information about that topic or that deep sky object that um, you, if you stick to those links that are in the slides, and the resources that I tell you about within this webinar, that those are the only places that you need to go for information to learn all about stellar evolution and galactic evolution. So this year, the event description says that students will demonstrate an understanding of the properties and evolution of stars and galaxies. And galaxies is sort of a new topic for the B Division event. And it's going to focus in, as it always does, anything relating to stellar evolution spectra across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, from radio and infrared, visible, ultraviolet, and X-ray, and a little bit of gamma ray, maybe. And each team will bring to the event for sort of a, a little help for the event are for the B division anyway, are two eight and a half by 11 um, pages worth of notes from any source. And those two pieces of paper can be used for both parts, part A and part B of the competition. It used to be that the notes could not be used in part, the first part, which is on constellations, and any deep sky objects or major stars within them, they were only used during the second part, but now you can make notes for both sections of questions for the B division event. So it does say that, uh, it does mention flashlights and clipboards, red flashlights and clipboards. There is never uh, a situation at nationals where we use any more any kind of planetarium. So, but there are some regionals or states that may have a planetarium that they want to use for a particular competition. So you need to look on your state website 
uh, ask your state director, whoever is organizing the competition, if there is going to be the need for you to bring that flashlight and that clipboard. So as we, as you know, those of you who have done this competition before, it's divided into two parts. And part one is all on constellation star and deep sky object identification. So the first part requires knowledge of a lot of different kinds of star charts. So I will show you a couple of resources where you can go and get an idea of what, what these might be, because there are several different ways that you can present constellations in charts and diagrams. So part one, here is a list of the constellations. The constellation names are underlined after them if there are any of the major stars in these competition in these um, constellations that you need to know this year. They have been uh, bolded. And then after that, if there are any deep sky objects that are part of this year's uh, competition, those are italicized for you. So for instance, the first constellation is Andromeda. Uh, you're not, uh, and it is a, a constellation that does not have any major bright stars of any interest whatsoever. So there's no star associated with that particular constellation you need to know. But that is the location of M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. So this is a list of the deep sky objects and the stars and the constellations that they are located in for which you are expected to be knowledgeable about. And do not forget that these stars, every one of these stars is in a different stage of stellar evolution. So you need to know the evolutionary stage and history of these major stars, bright stars in these constellations. Part two has some subparts. You need to know about stellar and galactic evolution. Um, and I will go over that a little bit with you in general. The spectral classification of stars, because every single thing we know about a star comes from these from spectroscopy or analysis of its spectra. The Hubble classification of galaxies. As you will see, galaxies don't exactly evolve from one stage to another. Uh, they change shape by different interactions with other galaxies, as you will see. And then observations using multi-length observations from different spacecraft and telescopes around the country or up in the sky and the relationship between the, the properties of stars, the temperature, the, the radius, the luminosity, um, and the for mathematical means. And in, in, in this event, you do not bring a calculator, so any math that needs to be done can be simply done pencil and paper by hand. There's no great uh, application of mathematics here. And the only mathematics involved is the mod distance modulus and the inverse square law. So I have sorted the different deep sky objects, the DSOs, into categories so that you'll get a feel for the focus of this event for 2020. So that you can see there are 19 stars. These are all the stars that are within the constellations that are bolded and they are all in a different evolutionary stage that you will learn about as you go along. There are 12 galaxies, and there are eight star formation regions or nebulae that are where star formation is going on. So then besides that, there are only two other objects, and one is Sagittarius A, the black hole in the center of the Milky Way galaxy, and T Tauri, which is a protostar, it's not just a protostar, it is actually a, a stage of stellar evolution from one particular class of stars that I'll mention a little bit as we go along. But you will see here, as we go and look at this graphic that is an illustration, a visual illustration of stellar evolution, that nothing, that nothing in that list was a supernova remnant or a planetary nebula or a neutron star or a black hole. So this will show you that what they're really focusing in on for 2020 is the evolution or the formation of stars at the very beginning. So we are actually looking at protostars uh, and 
stars that have just only the bright stars in those constellations and the evolutionary sequences that they've gone through, but we're not looking at any final end products. Now that was a really nice, pretty visual uh, image of stellar evolution, but more scientifically uh, useful for us, of course, is the HR diagram. And if you are unfamiliar with that, we'll go over it a little bit more in detail uh, later on. However, I'll be using some of the terminology from the HR diagram as we go along. So that uh, line through the middle of the HR diagram is the main sequence where normal stars uh, reside, stars that have started their, their hydrogen to helium fusion, and they will stay on the main sequence until they run out of hydrogen and start to evolve into other uh, different stages of stellar evolution. Now, the, the uh, axes of the HR diagram, you will see, uh, the horizontal ones have temperature at the top and um, spectral class at the bottom because the spectral classes are uh, spectral classes because of the temperature of those stars. So that's one of the physical characteristics that's plotted on the HI di HR diagram, the temperature and or class. It's plotted against the absolute magnitude or how bright the star actually appears to be. And the counter to that is luminosity, which is how bright the stars are compared to our sun. So the absolute magnitude, the intrinsic brightness of a star, is a physical property of a star. The luminosity is simply an arbitrary relative scale relative to the sun. And besides being on the, um, having this combination that gives you the, the position of a star in the HR diagram, the other thing that's pretty important is the luminosity class that's associated with it. Um, you have the um, luminosity going getting brighter as you go up from V, as you'll, as you'll see, the main sequence is luminosity class V, the subclass is IV, and then you go up to two where the giants are, and then one, they have one A and one B on this particular one. Uh, you can have, for instance, a star that is a GO star, stellar classification, and if you look, go up through, the, the red column uh, above the G0, you will see that if that is a main sequence star, it is its luminosity class is V. But if you go all the way up to the luminous supergiant branch, you will see that it is now luminosity class 1, one of the most luminous, brightest stars that there, there are. So it, it is a combination of both the spectral classification and the luminosity that tells you the evolutionary progress of a star. We will go into the Hubble classification of galaxies a little bit later on. However, as I have said, there is no evolution of galaxies. When Hubble first put together his tuning fork diagram of galaxies by morphology, by shape, uh, it was thought at that time that galaxies started as one shape and then evolved into other shapes over time. We know now that is not true. Galaxies do not evolve from shape to shape. They do change their shapes. They do change, but they change because of interactions with each other. You, they collide. They run through each other. They get into this gravitational association and they affect each other and cause things to happen. Uh, and that is how galaxies change over time, but there is no evolutionary pathway. The first constellation is Andromeda, which is a pretty faint with no really obvious stars in it. It looks to me like, you know, it's sort of, it's associated with a great square Pegasus if you're lucky enough to actually have dark skies and you can look at the constellations and see where they are in the night sky. Pegasus in the winter is that great big huge square. Andromeda are those two, look, it looks like a couple of legs hanging off uh, Pegasus. Um, and the Andromeda galaxy, M31, is a spiral galaxy and it is 
sort of very similar to the Milky Way galaxies. They, they look very similar to each other. They're both spiral galaxies. Uh, they're both about the same size. Um, Andromeda is um, 2 million light years away. So we're seeing it the way it was 2, mil 2 million years ago. And there have been some very interesting observations of M31. Some of the Chandra observations have shown a very different assortment of black holes in the galaxy M31. And they found a lot of black holes in the globular clusters, which reside above and below the plane. And we don't find those in the Milky Way galaxy globular clusters at all. Um, just to let you know, because globular clusters, though, are not a main focus for the content this year. This is uh, what the Milky Way galaxy looks like if you're lucky enough to be in a place where you can actually see the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. That's the disk of the galaxy that we're looking at. Um, actually, I like that one a whole lot because it has those yellow streaks at the bottom of fireflies. And so you can see light from the fireflies and light from the stars in the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, on the Milky Way galaxy, excuse me, as we're looking towards the center of the Milky Way galaxy towards the constellation of Sagittarius. Here's another view of it, more from the southern hemisphere. Um, and however, in about four billion years, it is predicted that the Andromeda galaxy, uh, because it, along with the Milky Way, is part of the local group of galaxies, and they're gravitationally bound with each other, that Andromeda is moving in the direction of the Milky Way, and it is thought that it might be an actual straight-on bullseye collision between the two bulges of the, of the two galaxies. Or at least if, if it's a near miss, then the halos will become and the spiral arms would become gravitationally bound with each other, and they would enter the dance of gravity and end up being as one larger galaxy, one galaxy with a little bit of strippage left behind. Who knows? But that's four billion years in the future. By then, the sun will have gone through its red giants, be pretty much into its red giant stage, and the Earth will be incinerated anyway, so we'll never be able to see the collision between M31 and the Milky Way. The next constellation is Aquila that has a star Altair in it and it is the constellation of the eagle. And uh, Aquila is a uh, IVV luminosity classification. That means it's just leaving the main sequence, going up to what's called the subgiant stage on its way to the red giant stage. Um, Aquila is actually a very rapidly rotating star that has it's rotating so fast that it's no longer spherical. It has been squished and kind of flattened, so the equatorial diameter is much wider than the than the um, north and north south uh, perpendicular equator. It is rotating so fast that it's quite ellipsoidal in shape, and it is rotating once every ten point four hours. Uh, moving at 470,000 kilometers per sec, uh, miles per hour. That's kind of fast. So it's barely holding itself together as it rotates that fast. Aquila and Altair is part of the asterism for the summer triangle, along with a couple of the other stars that are part of the your have-to-know stars within the constellations of Deneb and Vega. And Vega. Uh, the asterism for those three constellations, those three bright stars, is in the summer sky in the northern hemisphere. Um, Auriga is the next constellation in the list. Um, it has a very bright star, Capella, and Capella is actually a binary system, and they're both red giants, so they are on the red giant branch of the HR diagram. And it also has another binary pair orbiting much further away from the capella that we see, which is A and B together, the, the, two, um, the two red giants. But it has two main sequence red dwarfs that are also orbiting it as a binary pair not too far away. Okay, so the next constellation is Boadies a Shepherd. That is also another red giant. Uh, that is in a kind of a strange situation, too, because Arcturus 
is moving at about 150 kilometers per second, perpendicular to the plane of the galaxy. It's part of what's known as the, um, the Arcturus stream of stars. It's got a lot of stars that's going with it. And they, they are all uh, moving above the plane of the galaxy and will eventually escape. 